Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for your blessing as we open your word and, uh, and feast on this banquet of truth that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Um, so it is uh, a quarter to 12. Again, I want to remind you at 12.30, you can come and drive through and drop off your tithes and offerings or pick up a lesson if you didn't get one. Um, I was going to do a recap from last week. Uh, there's no time, so I'm just going to go straight into the message this morning. I want to ask you a question. When you were a child, um, what did you want to be when you grew up? What did you want to be when you grew up? Um, answer that right now. How about here in the audience? What did you want to be when you grew up? Teacher. A teacher? Okay. Of what age group, by the way? This is my wife answering. What age group did you? Elementary. elementary. You want to be an elementary teacher. Anybody else here? Either a cop or Batman. Either a cop or Batman. I identify with the Batman one. <laughs> yeah. A teacher. A preschool teacher. Okay. Well, um, when I was a very, very small boy, I wanted to be Superman or, or, or Batman. In fact, I remember um, we, there's a picture someplace in my mom's uh, treasury of photos where I don't know how old I am, but I'm out in the middle of the street in the house we used to live in, and I have a towel on, and I'm, you know, I'm just, just running back and forth pretending I was, I was Batman. When I was a little bit older, um, in my uh, probably 19, 20, 21 years old, I wanted to be a fireman. And I went through the physical agilities test. This was in LA. And I did the written test, and that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a fireman. And uh, so many of us have these big hopes and dreams of w what we want to be or where we want to be in the future. Um, or what kind of spouse we would like to have in the future. Many of us have these hopes and dreams. Some of them come true, some of them don't. Um, the Bible also gives a descriptors uh, of hopes and dreams, of big promises um, that the Lord gives us. I want to call this sermon, Castles in the Air. Castles in the air is a reference to um, when we say, you know, the pie in the sky, castles in the air, these hopes and dreams and uh, aspirations that are probably unlikely to happen, you know, our imagination going wild. Are God's promises castles in the air? The first uh, two weeks ago, I talked about um, how Christ is our Christ in crisis. Last week, I talked about COVID-19 and the apocalypse. Today, I want to talk about God's promises. Can we rely on these promises? How can we incorporate them into our lives in the stressful times that we're going through right now? First, I want to talk about our world for a little bit, and then we're going to go over the promises. Um, many of us readily recognize that our world is broken. Um, it's just messed up. I don't mean to be so dire and, and, and gloomy, there's a lot of beautiful in our world. In the natural world, there's a lot of beauty to appreciate and to thank God for. In the social world, in our relationships, there's a lot of good people in this world today that are exemplary in their integrity and in their compassion and in their love. So not everything in our world is all gloomy and depressive and, and dark. But the fact of the matter is, our world is a broken place, and it all started with a fateful decision in the Garden of Eden, in Genesis chapter 3. Um, you know the story, I don't need to rehearse the whole thing. Adam and Eve basically wanted to do their own thing. Um, they believed a lie uh, from Satan. They believed his lie. They were, um, they were duped. Um, Satan has a marvelous way of deceiving and mixing truth and error together so that it is very alluring and um, believable. Unfortunately, Adam and Eve believed the lie and they made that uh, wrong decision and it just introduced a lot of brokenness. Probably number one, brokenness in relationships because Adam and Eve's relationship with God was broken. It, it, it 
experienced a tremor, an earthquake, a split. And even though we do have communion with God, we, don't, we no longer have face to face. The Bible says in Isaiah, our sins have separated us from God in that intimate, holy, face to face communion. We're thankful that Jesus is the ladder that connects heaven and earth. Amen. We're thankful that we have connection to the throne of grace once again, according to Hebrews 4.16. But it all started in Eden. And God said something very interesting um, in Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. He said this, sin is crouching at the door. This is what he said to Cain. Sin is crouching at the door. It's right there. And this, is, this describes our, our brokenness. There's always something there to entice us that is attractive and appealing. There's always something there and that something is diametrically opposed to God's will and His ways, His loving will and His wise ways. And that sin crouching in the door, that comes from God's own, own lips. That's the brokenness of our world. Sin is a grievous sore on the soul of humanity. Our world is a long, long history of mankind's quest for establishing a utopia on earth for pleasure, for self-fulfillment, for gratification, all without the confines of God watching over your shoulder. That is the long complex history of humanity. We've seen in general history sages and saviors longing to establish this archaic idea of, of an earthly utopia. The offer, the off, excuse me, the offer um, of a millenn millenarian solution to all human problems. Um, and that is a tricky undertaking. It is, it is very, <laughs> because of our brokenness and our ruinous, the ruinous nature of our world, that's not an easy thing to, to do. In fact, it's a failing enterprise. Let me give you some examples. Hitler attempted his thousand year Third Reich in the 30s and 40s. Sir Thomas More imagined the perfect home in a fictional city-state utopia in his book published in 1516. Socrates argued for the ideal utopian state that would stand as a model for all emerging or existing societies in Plato's book, The Republic, and that was published in the 500s, the late, excuse me, the late 300s BC. So these aspirations to establish a paradise on earth, at the very least a place where justice and equality exist, they're always qualified by their creators. Anybody who attempts this, it's, that project will always be qualified by who is attempting this project. For example, in the Middle Ages, theology was the optimal approach for an idealized society, but with it came abuses. Look at the abuses of religion in the Middle Ages. The century, the 18th century goddess of reason was another attempt at utopia, at utopia and the atrocities of the French Revolution, followed by the 19th century's preeminence of science and its method, the scientific method, However, it comes with a continual alteration of theory culture. In the 21st century, maybe technology is the way to establish a utopia on earth. We tend to depend and praise and sometimes even deify um, uh, technology as a reigning wizard that can zap all of society's ill. I'm a subscriber to Wired magazine and every now and then, Wired will always uh, come up with ways to save our world, and it's usually through technology or through GMOs, et cetera, et cetera. No reference to becoming better people, better individuals through a relationship with our Creator. Obviously, those things are not going to be included in magazines as such. The founding fathers of the United States tried it, and they did pretty good at it, although there are still abuses in our American society. Um, even with the freedoms that we enjoy today. In biblical spiritual history, if you open the Bible, utopia originated where? In Eden. It originated in the Garden of Eden, a place and state of absolute perfection created by a lavish God who loves beauty and variety and pleasure and goodness and relational bliss 
and truth. This is what God did for us on earth. But according to biblical history, of course, Eden was blighted by evil, instigated by Satan, and of course the rest is, the rest is history. And since then, the Bible portrays the mournful pattern of humanity's warped interpretation of utopia without the handicap of a watchdog divinity. As I said earlier, God just watching over your shoulder. God is just too intrusive. He's just too intrusive. In fact, God told the prophet Samuel, they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me. This bitter pill that God has often swallowed with his covenant people, with the people he chose for himself. And God has often had to go through that heartache of being rejected by his own people. Why? Because we want to have our own version of paradise on earth, not realizing that paradise was lost. But there's always been a people who have seen things differently. God is peace and freedom. For these, God satisfies the innermost yearnings, even in a hostile world, that kingdoms cannot. Indicative of embracing a spiritual cosmology, not just naturalism or a materialistic one. This is the advantage of scriptures and what they reveal as true history, that we can live in this world, in the here and now, this fallen, broken world, in the present, in the here and now, and yet experience by faith God's kingdom of love and power and grace and a hope for a better and a future world. That is our privilege and that is the promise. Now, Isaiah chapter 25, I want to share some scriptures now. I'm going to change gears here and share with you God's promise of a utopia on earth, this castle in the air, so to speak. Isaiah chapter 25 um, which was read earlier in the scripture reading, verses 8 and 9. He will, he will swallow up death for all time, and the Lord God will wipe tears away from all faces. How many people are crying today because they lost their loved ones to COVID-19? Um, I don't know, some of you may have seen videos that are coming out of Ecuador. It is horrible. Um, body bags in hospitals and, and they're not getting help and people uh, leaving uh, dead bodies in the streets of their loved ones, sometimes in, uh, usually in coffins. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a horrible, it's a horrid scene to, to see uh, what's happening over, I think if I'm not mistaken, by the way, Ecuador is the hardest hit uh, country in, in Latin America, I believe so, or in South America, I should say. Um, the Bible says in Isaiah, he will remove the reproach of his people from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. Um, Behold, this is our God for whom we have waited that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. And some people, they ask, when is this going to happen? When is this going to come? Revelation chapter 21, verses 3 and 4 say, And I heard a loud voice from the, from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among whom? Among men, humanity, mankind. And he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death. No more death. There will no longer be any mourning, M-O-U-R-N, crying, or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Now, how many people in our history have died with this hope in their hearts and did not yet experience it because death came sooner? How many people today, Christians and people the world over, will read things like this and it may seem so unreal or surreal in times like this. Now I intentionally am sharing these words of promises because when times are prosperous and where everything is going good, we can find it perhaps easier to take hold of these promises. When times are really rough and we're down and we're 
just in those dark moments, we may tend to forget these things. And um, so I want to ask, are these words of a grandiose future just romanticized versions of hope? It's been 2,000 years since we've been waiting for the second coming of Christ. 2,000 years. In the days of the apostles, they felt by, if you read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, you get some hints that they felt that the second coming of Christ would come in their days. So are they just romanticized versions of hope? Are these written promises just castles in the air, wishful thinking? Um, let me share a couple of promises with you that have come true in Scripture. The first one that I can think of is the Messiah. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, way in the beginning when paradise was lost, when Adam and Eve made that horrible decision that just uh, the reverberations of that decision are continuing today, the doom and the sadness and the pain and the heartache of that one decision continues till today. And in that context, in the Garden of Eden, when they were still in the garden and they hadn't been kicked out yet, while they were still there, God gives them a promise of hope for the future in Genesis 3.15. He is promising the Messiah even then. And we all know that the Messiah did come. Um, I, I'm not going to go over math, but I've seen some figures where um, the, a Messiah to come and fulfill all the promises stated in the Old Testament, the likelihood of somebody doing that is, you know, one to the hundredth power. I don't remember what the math is, but Jesus actually fulfilled every single one of those prophecies in the, in the Old Testament. Um, that is a prophecy come true. This one is really interesting. In Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 28, it says, It is I who says of Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and he will perform all my desire. And he declares of Jerusalem, She will be built, and of the temple your foundation will be laid. This was said about a hundred years before King Cyrus. King Cyrus was an actual figure in real history. God, through the prophet um, uh, Isaiah, had prophesied that this king will come. And in fact, some more says, Isaiah chapter 45, verse 1, Thus says the Lord to Cyrus his anointed, whom I have taken by the right hand, to subdue nations before him, and to loose the loins of kings, to open doors before him, so that the gates will not be shut, etc. Here is a prophecy that came true. And then you think of Daniel chapter 2, prophecy or promises that came true. You think of Daniel chapter 2 and God predicting the rise and fall of nations. There are many, many promises like this that if we read in Scripture, it backs it up by history that these promises were fulfilled or prophecies. Um, dire circumstances and trials and troubles have the potential of overriding memories of prosperity and happiness. And I was just thinking about this the other day. I was telling my wife, what if in a month or two, Things are really bad. Let's just say, for example, three million people have died from this pandemic. Um, th things have just come to a stop. Things are coming to a stop, as you know, these lockdowns in cities and nations. And if it gets worse, which according to the sources, things will get worse before they get better. You know, there's, the curve is still going up. But let's just say in the next couple of months, things are so bad that millions of people are dying and it's just really, really, really bad. Let's say rioting takes place and people breaking into markets, etc., cetera, um, stealing supplies and food, etc., and murders are taking place. I know I'm painting a bleak picture, but let's say this happens. For the sake of my, let's say this happens. What can happen, very well happen to our psyches is that we forget the good times and the positive times and the prosperous times that we had before. In fact, if you drive through Phoenix or through LA or through Las Vegas or through New York, you've seen the pictures on, on the news networks. The streets are empty. The streets are empty. And no smog. And no smog. If this continues and gets worse, we may have to say, oh yeah, I remember how I used to go through traffic and it was bumper to bumper. That's right. I totally forgot about all of that smog. I forgot about this. 
really, really hard times tend to play tricks on your memory and you forget how things were before. And that's a danger. Part of the problem is that we forget to remember. We think we will remember a great experience forever, but don't factor in the distractions of everyday life which render that fond memory harder and harder and harder to access. So let me share with you something from Stephanie Tully. She's a, an assistant professor of marketing at USC Marshall. And this is what she says. Um, they conducted some experiments on this forgetfulness and remembering. They found that participant, participants who thought about a future experience, thinking about taking a fantastic trip to Europe, for example. They found that participants who thought about a future experience predicted they would think about and talk about that experience. They predicted that more often than other participants who actually reported having done for a past experience. In other words, if we think of good times in the future, those experiences will disappear during the bad times, and we tend to remember the bad. Which leads me to my second point. Bad and hurtful experiences seem to riv rivet themselves more deeply in our minds. And why is that we remember a terrible accident more than we do a pleasant experience? Um, for those who are cynical and pessimistic by nature, this is even more so. So if I were to tell you a story of a little boy who buys a dear little puppy at the store, and he was just so happy, and he cuddled that puppy and he watched it grow and they were best of friends. That's one story. If I tell you the story of I saw a terrible accident outside and there was a 50 car pileup and it came out in the news and there were bodies strewn and sirens, et cetera, and it was horrible and I ran to there and I tried to help people and I got some blood on my hands. Which story are you going to remember more? <laughs> people tend to remember the bad things more. Um, Eric G. Wilson, who wrote, Everyone Loves a Good Train Wreck, Why We Can't Look Away, this is what he says about our humanness. He says this, and I find this very, very interesting. Thus began the awkward split, one that most of us suffer, between socially acceptable facades and interior strangeness. And I know this is sort of heavy wording, so I'm going to read it slow. The exterior is a useful mask, necessary for survival and success. Many of us wear masks, is what he's saying. Those lacking such an appearance are misanthropes, losers, or lunatics. But we all understand those, those times that we are honest, late on an insomniac night, the limits of this veil of our mask that we wear, wear. The engrossing action is inside, where our appetites run rampant. Lust for power and erotic pleasure, fantasies of failure and sometimes death. So what he's saying in this quote is what I just said is sometimes we tend to focus and remember the evil more. What he is saying is a take on our tendency to put on these masks and wear them and I would say really not deal with the darkness that is, that is inside. And so this is a description of our humanity, of our brokenness in our world today. Now, the answer to this, how to remember these castles in the air. I just, for the last 10 minutes, I'm all talking about darkness and gloom and our brokenness and suffering and pain and pandemics. And I'm being actually very depressing. I haven't for the last few minutes, but that's intentional. The reason why I say this is because you and I need to intentionally and purposefully remember the good. Remember the promises of God. Remember these castles in the air. God has promised He will fulfill. There are promises in Scripture that He has fulfilled and He will meet His promises that He makes of a new world, of strengthening us in the present, of giving us abundant life in the here and now, and of course, and eternal life in the future. This is how God operates. No manner, no degree, no level of hurt or pain or suffering, as the Bible says, can separate us from God. The tricky thing in all of this 
is that we can forget to count our blessings and forget to concentrate and focus on even in the trials the reasons why we can be thankful. We need to intentionally remember. I want to share a passage with you in the Bible, and this is in Deuteronomy chapter 6. How to remember those promises, how to remember those castles in the air. And God had incorporated in the Jewish, in Jewish families, God had told them to do something that would help them to intentionally remember. No matter what happens, God is with us. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. This is what it says. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which, which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. So he's saying, let these words be on your heart. Remember these words. I am your God. Worship me. And then this is what he says in verse 7. You shall teach them all of these words that God is speaking, his commandments, his statutes, his civil laws, um, you know, the society that he is ordering for, ordering for the Israelites, um, the way they were to treat each other and even treat foreigners and strangers, the way they were to um, relate not only with each other but with God, everything that God is saying, those words. He says, you shall teach them diligently to your sons, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house. Talk about these things when you sit in your house. When we're sitting around the table and eating together, what are we talking about? Are we talking about the pandemic? Are we talking about Ecuador? Are we talking about um, people hoarding things and selling them at a 700% increase? What are we talking about when we are together as a family? This is what God says. He's not saying don't talk about the common things in life. He's not saying don't catch up on the news reports. That's not what God is saying. What he is saying is talk about me. Talk about the Bible. Talk about the stories of the Bible. Talk about how God rescued his people. Talk about how times, those, the times where the people did fail God, but God was merciful. Yes, God did bring punishments upon them, but he would always promise a future restoration. Talk about the good things that God has done. Talk about the laws. Rehearse with the children the Ten Commandments. Okay, uh, Johnny, what does uh, the Fifth Commandment mean? What, does, what is the First Commandment? Anybody? God is saying, talk about these things when you're together. That is intentional. That is purposeful. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. This is what God is saying. Remembering me and what I stand for and who I am and what I have for you and the plans that I have for you, my intentions and purposes for you as my people, I want you to talk about and remember these things on a daily basis. Daily. Why do you think God said in the seventh commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy? Why would he use that word, remember? Because we're forgetful beings. And here God is giving a familial law and a very strong tip this is the way you're not going to forget me. Talk about it every day. When you get up in the morning, he says, talk about it. At the breakfast table, do your devotions. We do our devotions. We pray. At night when we lie down. I remember when my son was about that high, uh, five, four, five, six, seven years old. And if my son is watching, he's going to remember this. Um, we had... Um, a set of books in, on our bookcase at home, 10 volumes of the, uh, what were the, the Maxwell books, the Bible stories, those blue volumes. And I would take those volumes, and boy, he just looked forward to these times. I'd sit on the edge of his bed, I'd open the book, 
and he'd be covered with his blankets. I'd tuck him, and I'd tell him, <clears throat> I'd tell him a, a bedtime story from those books. Of course, I would dramatize it, <clears throat> and I would, you know, I'd use the voices, uh, you know, Goliath, arr! but he really, really enjoyed them. And after he was in a different stage in his, in his youth, we got him cassettes. Maybe when he was 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, we got him cassettes. And he would listen to those cassettes at night and Bible stories every night, every night. To this day, I promise you, he does not forget those stories. He can tell you those stories to this day. So I want to encourage, especially fathers, especially the dads, I know one particular dad who's hardly home because he's a truck driver and he travels from state to state. So obviously that's an exception. There are exceptions. But fathers, if you have young children and you're at home at night, I want you to tell them bedtime stories. Um, they're going to love it. They will love you for it. It is the best way to instill God's words and what he is saying here in young children the bedtime stories, and then, of course, pray together. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 6, verse 8, you shall bind them, his words, his commandments, as a, as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now, this is Deuteronomy chapter 6. After Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy is the last book of the Pentateuch. You know who is saying this? This is God saying this through Moses. Moses is saying these things to the people because they're just about to go into the promised land. They're just about to go in after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And Moses is saying, okay, and he gets out his book and says, okay, I've got to remind you guys of these things. These are very important. Perk up your ears because this is very, very important. Moses said this to them in their day when they were going into Canaan and they're going to encounter opposing views, worldviews, and philosophies and religions and practices. And he was saying, you've got to do this. How much more for us today? How much more for us today that we need to practice these things? This is how to remember those promises of God, these quote-unquote castles, castles in the air. They are real promises. Rehearse them every day. Rehearse them in your mind, in your heart. Read your Bible. Remember those promises. Memorize scripture. Have family devotions together in the evenings. Have bedtime stories. Talk about these things. This is the way that we can be bolstered and buoyed and strengthened in times and stressful times like this. And remember that God is good. He is with us and he will pull through for us and ultimately fulfill his promises of a new world where there's not going to be any of these things at all. We've Amen. got to remember these things, but we have to intentionally remember them. They're not going to come automatically into our minds. Let's pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your great promises of Scripture. We thank you, God, that you are with us, that we don't need to be discouraged or dismayed or depressed because your strong right arm will uphold us, Isaiah 41.10. We know, Jesus, that we can do all things because you give us strength. We know, Lord Jesus, that you hear our prayers, you hear our supplications, and that you have not abandoned us. You promised us, Lord, that you will be with us until the very end. So we thank you, Lord Jesus, so much for all of these promises. And Lord, this promise of a new world, a new earth, where we will have no pestilences, no sicknesses, no tears, no pain, no heartache. Lord, these are our experiences today in this world. Please, God, help us to intentionally remind us ourselves that we are looking forward to a new world. We are on the path. We are on this journey. We're on our way to heaven. And Lord, we thank you for that promise. Help us, God, to be practical in our reminding ourselves of your great and precious promises. We know, Lord, even the Apostle Peter said that through your glorious promises that we become partakers of your divine nature. These promises strengthen us. They change us. So, Lord, we thank you and we pray that we will do our part through your Holy Spirit to keep these things in mind and in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said,
Amen. Well, God bless you at 12.30 in just a few minutes. Thank you. In just a few minutes, in 10 minutes, we're going to have that drive-through through our church. You can bring your tithes and offerings and de uh, deposit them in the basket. We have our vote to take. Uh, this is Linda Lewis uh, from our Tempe Church to uh, Oregon. We had, including myself, uh, 24 people that have voted, and they had all said yes. And so we thank you for um, calling in or texting and giving your vote. May the Lord bless you and have a great Sabbath.